good morning, guys. Kiddos, come on up. Oh, I'm supposed to be using this. My bad. You guys get in a circle with your team. Turn around, Austin. You're right here. This is your team. Turn around. There you go. Yep, you're in this team right here. All right, you guys are a team. Turn around and face each other. There you go. You have a strategy session. You have just a few seconds to come up with the number of balloons that your team can sex successfully blow up and tie in one minute. So discuss. Discuss. Yeah, I changed the times on things. So discuss with one another who has what skill, all that kind of stuff, how many you think you can do in one minute. If someone in your team has the skill to tie a balloon, you should definitely know who that is. Okay? All right. Team balloons. How many? Maybe five? No, I need a promise. Three? Let's keep that nice and low. Okay. How many do you think you guys can? Two. How many do you think you guys can do? At least five. Is that a promise? I like, I like this. You don't know how to do it. Now, I also want to say each person in your team should have some job to do. So if you can't blow up a balloon, maybe your job should be to get the balloon or to be like the cheerleader or to be the one who holds the balloons after it's what something, because just standing there watching is lame and not teamwork, right? Everybody who has a job where you have to work with a group, you know that's not cool if you have no job. All right, are we ready? All right, you're going to have one minute. There's some balloons over here. You're going to need to, whoa, you're going to need to send someone to get a balloon. Okay, ready? On your mark. Get set. Hey, what were your promises? Two, three, and five, right? Okay, go. Oh, you're definitely going to need to stretch those out. I'll give you that clue. Stretch them out first. You want to come help? You want to come help? You want to come help? T or she's, she's over there help. Well, yeah. You want to come help? You want to help this team right here? You can help them. Jason right here. Jason. All right. Twenty seconds left. Tight. Oh, they're all gone. Two, one. Time's up. Time's up. Get in your team. Hold your balloon up if you've got it blown up. That's okay. How many do we've got? None. How many we got? Five. Woo! Five. How many we got? Five. five. So we have one team that got more, lots more than they thought. We have one team. Did we get five or six? Five. Awesome. And then we have one team that really struggled, which, you know what? Truth. Let's just hashtag ordinary lives right there, right? Okay. So have a seat for just one second. Have a seat. You can jump up on the stage. That's fine. Thank you, adults, for stepping in and helping. Because you know what? There's a big word on the chalkboard behind you right now. Who can read me that word? The prophecy. Who can remember what prophecy means? Yes. Dang. Ah, foretold future. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, foretold future. And Pastor Mark's going to talk about prophecy this morning. You're going to talk about, do you need space on the stage, Jack? Come down here, bud. So, he's going to talk about prophecy. Who... In the Old Testament, did God promise to send? It starts with an M. Who was he going to send? Yes, the Messiah. That's correct. 
And the Messiah's job was to do what? Yeah, he was going to save he was going to save the people. He was going to fix things, right? So, did God do that? You think? So God sent the Messiah. Who was the Messiah? What's his name? Jesus. That's exactly right. And so Pastor Mark's going to talk this morning about prophecy, and he brought shalom points. He's going to talk about prophecy and Jesus and all kinds of things like that. And prophecy is truth. So sometimes when we make a promise, are we able to keep it? Sometimes not. Sometimes we need help from other people to keep our promise, right? God always keeps his promises. So we didn't have enough of balloons for everybody, so you just have to imagine what that's like to blow balloons this morning. You can go home and try that out. I wanted to talk to you as we talked about this idea of prophecy, this idea of promise. The individuals in the Bible that first address this idea of God keeping his promises are the writers of the Gospels. We have three Gospels we call the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Synoptic means they tell it in a similar way, in a similar fashion. We have a fourth Gospel writer named John. He tells things a little differently, but the same story, the same truth. Of the first three synoptic gospels, we have one disciple and one eyewitness. We believe that Mark, also known as John Mark, was possibly the young man who ran away without clothing from the uh, garden where Jesus was praying out of fear. But there's one gospel writer, his name is Luke, and he was a physician by trade, often traveled with Paul, but not an eyewitness to the gospel story, not an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. And so Luke is inspired by the Holy Spirit, however, even though he wasn't an eyewitness, to write the gospel, to write the story of God's story, to write the story of the promise that God kept, to write the story of God's prophecy becoming reality for the people. And what he does is he begins his gospel with a very clear, as was his personality, a very clear description of an explanation of why he bothered to do the hard work. You see, writing was not an easy task. It never is. But here was a task that was, to some, insurmountable. The fact, as you will see, and as you'll see in just a moment, he begins by saying, many have set out to do this. We have four of the Gospels, and we believe through tradition and history that these are the four that God inspired and, and God has in mind for all generations to have before them, but many others set out to write an account. Many others set out to write a story of Jesus. And Luke said, I'm going to do this diligently. I'm going to do this carefully. And the way he does this is through interviewing people, through using Mark as a source and other ways in which he can write the true story of Jesus. And so what I want you to do with me is begin by going to the very beginning of his writings. This is Luke again, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled, that's prophecy fulfilled, fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. This is a great word of detail. This is a great word of explanation. Luke says many have set out to do this, and it's an important task, and where we got our first source was from the eyewitnesses. And so Luke says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I think I will set out to do the same thing. Now he uses his personality, and he carefully investigates. He checks out the story and the backstory. And he writes not only the book of Luke, but he continues on and writes the book of Acts. And so there's a profound amount of literature that without Luke's recording, we would have much less knowledge than we do, particularly about the early days of the church, thanks to the book of Acts. Through this Lenten season, leading up 
to the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're going to be journeying through Luke. We're going to be journeying through this gospel. And that is why those of you who are keeping up with the readings for the week and the day, uh, we are reading through Luke together and eventually we'll make it to Acts as well. Now Luke begins at a very strategic place and maybe an obvious place. He begins by reminding the people of the fact that this Messiah story, that this Messiah journey, that the story of Jesus is not something that just happened to occur in the first century. And it's not something that just happened by happenstance. It's not something that it came up at the last minute and Jesus says, I think I'll answer this call. No, it is from the very beginning of time, even to the very beginning of the Genesis story, where God promises that one who is a child of humankind will smash the head of Satan, that he is going to send this great teacher, this great savior through his love. And he answers this. And so I want us to go to chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, where we find the most obvious explanation that we have had prophecy fulfilled. To lead up to the story, we understand that Jesus, as a boy in a great Jewish family, would have been circumcised on the eighth day, and approximately 31 days later, about 40 days later, and now in total, after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, as was the custom, head off to the temple for this great ceremony of the dedication of their baby. This was due to Old Testament law where the woman after giving birth was unclean symbolically for many days. And so while the scripture tells us this took place immediately, what they're saying is it took place after the time of purification. And so beginning in verse 22, we begin with this story. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves are two young pigeons. So this would have been uh, whether you are a family of much or a family of little. You could, some could afford the, fir the first and some the latter. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die because he had seen, before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Here we find... This prophet, this spokesperson for the Lord, who has been promised by no other than God himself that he will not die until he sees the Messiah. Now don't miss this point because Israel, as the scripture says, has been waiting for the consolation of the fulfillment of peace generation after generation after generation. Approximately 400 years have passed since the, new, the Old Testament prophet Malachi and the story of the gospel. So this is generation after generation after generation. Four centuries, the Hebrew people have waited. And most of them have no concept of when the Messiah will come. Jews today still are waiting. Many of them who are actually religious Jews, other than cultural Jews, religious Jews are still waiting in their theology for the Messiah, having no idea where, when he will come. Well, just as in that day, Simeon was one of the few that knew without a shadow of a doubt that he was going to see the Messiah in the flesh. Very unique situation. And what a great promise. He's already had some consolation in his heart, if you will, knowing that even though he's an aged man, his years are not over because God is going to keep his promise. God is going to fulfill his prophecy to him personally and to the people of Israel. 
Now, why is this the case in Simeon? Well, first of all, it's by God's choice. But what enabled him to do this? Well, you'll see a reference three times within a verse and a half that tells us why Simeon was able to trust God and was able to know that God was speaking the truth to him. I want to point out three phrases. These are found in verse 25 and 26. The first one is this, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Second phrase in the following verse, it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And finally, it says in verse 27, moved by the Spirit. In verse 25, in verse 26, in verse 27, Luke very carefully, as he said, investigates and therefore very carefully reports the fact that Simeon was not only a man after God's own heart as David was, not using those words, but in the same spirit. He is this man because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. This is a foreshadowing for all those who will come later, who none at this point, other than a select few throughout the scriptures, have had access to personally to the Holy Spirit and Simeon does have access personally to the Holy Spirit and therefore he's able to know more than those around him which should highlight for us interesting enough Luke writes this in his writing book of Acts this is the great testimony of the Spirit being available to all and so the Spirit is moving in Simeon in a way that he will move in those who know the promise so if you're a believer today, you have the Holy Spirit in you just as I do, and you understand that because of this, you can trust Jesus. You know that Jesus is coming back. Even though the world may th think you're crazy, you know because you're a believer that you are saved and the Spirit is coming, Christ is coming to redeem you. You know that because you know that because you know that, and you know that because the Holy Spirit is within you. This was the reason he was able to do this. Another reason, and a reason God picked him, is the scripture refers to him as a holy man and a righteous man. This man had devout faith. He was serious in his faith. A reminder that many Jews in the first century were very sincere in their faith. There were some obviously that turned their back on God. But many Jews, namely among them Simeon, was a person of great faith. You'll also, at your own time, later go in and read the story of Anna, where she too is a great person of God very much in the same passage. I want us to go back to verse 28 through 32 and hear what Simeon says. Simeon, moved by the Holy Spirit, given knowledge by the Holy Spirit, extends a blessing. He raises the child, baby Jesus, month and a half or so old Jesus, and says a blessing to God. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. What I want you to understand is this is not, again, an afterthought. This is not something that came up just because Simeon thought it was a good idea. You see, I said that there had been a silent period, about 400 years between Malachi and the beginning of the gospel story. Well, if you pay attentive, you give attentive care to these verses, you understand that he's actually quoting, in part, words that were 300 years more in antiquity than the time period of waiting. 700 years before Simeon, a man named Isaiah walked the earth. And God refers to Isaiah as a holy man, a prophet, one who's speaking the prophecy of God. I want us to go to Isaiah and listen for familiar words that we just heard from Simeon. This is in Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Verse 5. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all the springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and, you, and will make you to be a covenant for my people and a light for the Gentiles. 
to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Isaiah, 700 years before, and Simeon in the first century now are telling the same story and one that will be shocking to those who will hear it. It's shocking to the people who first heard Isaiah, and it's just as shocking, if not more, to the first century. Because after all, Jesus is the promise keeper. He is the promise fulfilled. And here God is saying, I am keeping my promise, but I'm keeping it more so than just to the people of Israel. I am keeping it to them, but I'm keeping my promise that I spoke 700 years prior, that this is also for the people known as the Gentiles. Broadly speaking, non-Jewish people. Now what you find in these texts, these parallel texts separated by seven centuries, is two very specific things about Jesus. I want to draw to your attention to two very important attributes of Jesus that are spoken in Isaiah by a man who did not know Jesus, only spoke of his coming as a servant of the Lord. And Simeon, who did not know Jesus as a grown man and a sacrificed Christ, but held Jesus in his hands as he was a baby. The first thing we see is that Jesus is salvation. Jesus is salvation. Isaiah 42, 7. To open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Notice the words to free captives and to release from prison. This is the definition of salvation. This is what it means to be saved, to be set free from change, to be set free from prison, to be set free from being a captive into being one who is free. This is salvation. Luke chapter 2, verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Put yourself in Simeon's shoes there for a moment if you can in your mind's eye. Here is Simeon, old man, waiting for years for the consolation of Israel, knowing, as few others do, that he himself will see Jesus, that he will see the salvation. You remember Jesus' word is a transliteration of this Yeshua, this word very much like the word Joshua in the Old Testament. The word means God saves. Don't miss this. <laughs> Simeon is holding the boy Jesus, who is named God Saves, and says, I am seeing the Lord's salvation. I am seeing the Lord's salvation. I am holding Yeshua, the New Testament Joshua, in my hands. But I, like the, the Joshua of the Old Testament, led them across the Jordan into a land. This is something more that Jesus will do, something profoundly more significant. He will take them out of the land of the dead into the land of the living. He will take them into a promised land, the ultimate eternal promised land. Here is Yeshua. I have seen my, his salvation. Jesus is salvation, and he is also light. Notice the story, the text in Isaiah and in Luke. Isaiah 42. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles. A light. Many of you know the song from when you're just a small child. This is a light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. We shine because Jesus shined. And we shine because Jesus says, I am going to be a light not only to the people of Israel, but to those who don't even know me yet. Even those who weren't even waiting on me. The, the Gentile people were going about their business, their everyday lives, doing the things they do. They had no concept of the Messiah. But Jesus says, I am coming to be their Messiah as well. Luke 2, verse 31 and 30 and 31. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations. What we see here in this text is broadening of the reach of salvation. This light. Now notice, if you could take a laser beam in the Old Testament and point it to the Israelite people, this light is very focused. It's intense focused. 
And just like a flashlight, when you turn it and the, the beam gets broader and broader, this is what God is doing. He's turning that flashlight in essence, and the light of Christ is going broader and broader and broader and broader and broader. And the broadening is welcoming more in to the kingdom of God. Simeon would have passed on before Paul became a Christian. But Luke would have been walking right by his side, and I picture Luke's smile on his face when Paul writes, For in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, or Jew or Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. But picture Luke's smile when Paul writes, For there is neither Jew nor Greek, Jew or Gentile. This is a fulfilled promise. The light has gone broader. Here is this great testimony. We go back to Luke. I want us to look at verse 34 and 35. It's an interesting text here. Puzzling text, quite honestly. It says, and Simeon blessed them. He's turned his eyes away from God, not in a disobedient sense, but he's been praising God. Now he's looking to the couple, mainly to Mary. It says, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that we've spoken against, so that the thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own heart too. Now, if we don't unpack that a little bit and research that a little bit, we're going to have a hard time understanding how this could be a blessing. When I hear blessings, I normally don't think of people telling me that my heart is going to be pierced. When I hear blessings, I normally don't think of people telling me that someone's going to stumble over this person of which whom we speak. This is a very interesting passage. And one of the things I love about it, as you see in all prophecy from God, actual prophecy, not make-believe prophecy, not someone who comes up with words that just might be, but actual prophecy, as Simeon knew his words were actual because the Holy Spirit gave them to him. And Luke writes true words because the Holy Spirit inspires him. One thing we see in common all through true prophecy is the honesty of it. One of the reasons that you can trust Scripture as a whole is because all the dirt is still in there. If I were writing the legacy of my family, a lot of things I would leave out. You know, if I were writing scripture about Israel and I wanted to have an account, I'd probably leave the whole David story out about Bathsheba. And if I were Paul writing about the story of Jesus, I would probably not talk about how many Christians I had hauled off to prison. And if I were Peter writing scripture, I wouldn't have told the whole part about me saying, Jesus, don't do this. And Jesus turns around and says, get behind me, Satan. I might leave that out of the dialogue. But scripture is true because it tells the whole story. And Simeon tells the whole story. Yes, it's a blessing. In other words, this is something that God is sending, this promise, this Jesus, your son. But this is not going to be easy. This is not going to be easy. Walter Bowie wrote this. He said, anybody who had happened along the streets of Bethlehem might have looked good-naturedly at the baby lying in Mary's arms. But by no means everybody would have looked good-naturedly at the Son of Man who afterward went out from Nazareth. I want you to notice the difference, in other words, between the celebration of the birth of Jesus and the recognition of the life of Jesus. There's a reason that Easter, particularly Good Friday, is a little more uncomfortable to many than Christmas. Christmas is the birth of an innocent baby who is a great answer of God. But then the life of Jesus is much less innocent. And by innocent, I mean it's much less easy to swallow. You can't look at the life of Jesus and say, that's easy to accept. You can't look at the life of Jesus and say, wow, everybody loved this guy. You look at the life of Jesus and say, he was focused on his purpose, and therefore he was a stumbling block to many. And what's the scripture say? The rising, falling, and rising of many in Israel. There will be a following. He will cause people to stumble. Not because he wants them to stumble, but because he is always true to what the Father has sent him to do. So it's truth. 
And I appreciate truth. I like it that God told us the truth. And I love the fact that Simeon has the courage, because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, to look into the eyes of a mother who's had her first child by the miracle of God. Looks her in the eyes and says, a sword will pierce your heart. I don't recommend you go say this to new moms when you visit them in the hospital. That's not an easy word to pass on. But he passed it on anyway because of the truth of God. So what do we do with these words? So what of the words to Mary? Look at them again. Verse 35. A child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that we spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In the Roman Catholic tradition, Mary is often referred to as Our Lady of Sorrows. The reason she's referred to as Our Lady of Sorrows is because of the sorrow she experienced. And there is art depicting both in sculpture and in painting a Mary with seven swords piercing her body. Some of you are familiar with this image. Mary, the mother of Jesus, with seven swords piercing her body. The first of the seven swords is a visual reminder of this first account. Roman Catholic Church talks about six other piercings of Mary, and you read the Gospels, you can understand that Mary was pierced several times in the sense of hurt. But this is the first sword. This is the sword that pierces her heart, her soul, and she is a lady of sorrow in this text. She's a woman of joy, but also a woman of sorrow, for she knows that this will not be an easy journey. But I want you to notice what goes on here between Simeon and Mary. There's honest dialogue, even though very little is spoken. They're on the same team. They recognize that they're called to a difficult task. And Simeon is through with his task. And Mary's just beginning hers in many ways. But there's a phrase in that verse 26 that we need not skip. It's easily missed. But we, we must not miss it because if we do, we miss how this interacts with our lives. You see, we are not prophets. Jesus is the final revelation of God. There's no new knowledge about God after the Scriptures. There's no new knowledge about God. None of us are prophets in that sense. And none of us, obviously, are the mother of Jesus. So what do we have to do with this text? Or more appropriately, what does this text have to do with our lives? If you look at this little phrase, it is a profoundly fascinating phrase. Verse 35, it says, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. This is how the text intersects with your life and with mine. And I want you to notice the response of Mary and Simeon, and then think about your response. The response of Simeon is, Lord, take me now. You've kept your promise, I'm ready. I don't know what that looked like, I don't, I don't know when Simeon died, but I know he was a happy man when he did. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and... God, just come get me now. I'm ready to go. You've kept your promise. This is what he lived for. And Mary, who knows that her journey is not over, very similar to the days when she fell at the feet of the angel. And the angel said, you will bear the Son of God, not by man, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, which will come upon you and will conceive a child. And he will be named Emmanuel, God with us. And Mary asked, how can this be? Because I've never been with a man. How can this be? And she knows what's going to happen. She knows what the people are going to think about her. And she says, let it be done to me as you have said. Fast forward 40 days. Past the birth. Add nine months to that. And you hear a very serious and faithful woman once again. Verse 38. Luke 1. 
I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Verse 25, it says, so that the hearts would be revealed. So as I approach this text with you, I have a question for myself and I have a question for you. It's the same question. And that is, when the Spirit of God gets a hold of me and gets a hold of you, what is our response? What is our response? Are we, like Simeon, ready to do the will of God in his timing? Will we be willing to wait on God in his perfect timing? Some of you know without a doubt that God has you here for a dear purpose. That God has crafted you for a reason. And that is true for every single one of you. You don't know that. And sometimes it's very easily seen how God is going to do that. And sometimes it takes a lot of patience. And to you, I encourage you to have the patience of Simeon, knowing that God is indeed going to use you. And your task is to wait for him to say, now is the time. You see, a lot of us think, well, God, you've got a plan for my life. You've got a purpose for my life. And if you just hurry up and let me know what that is, or if you just hurry up and let me fulfill that, I'd be good. But Simeon waits year after year after year after year after year after year after year. And finally, God says here. Then you look at Mary. And you wonder, I urge you. Am I willing? Am I willing to allow God to do whatever he wants to do in my life? He's not calling you to bear the Son of God. But he's calling you to live for the Son of God. He's not calling you into public shaming that comes with a faith that no one will believe in the same way that Mary was called. Or perhaps you're called into a place where you will have to boldly stand for your faith and no one will believe you, no one will understand you, but yet you will still be faithful if you cling to the promise of God. There's patience and there's clinging to a promise. As we continue our journey through the book of Luke, we're going to encounter great story. We're going to encounter great history. We're going to encounter the wonderful purposes of the gospel writer. But let me remind you that Luke did not write to meet our curiosity. And Luke did not write in order to write history for history's sake. And Luke did not write so he could get his name in the annuals of history. He tells us right why he wrote. Again, I remind you. He says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. As we go through this So That You Will Know series, these eight weeks leading from now to the week after Easter, I want us to be able to, based, based upon the truth of God's word, to know so that we will know with certainty the truth. And that once we know the truth, that we will live by the truth. And so I want to invite each of you right now to truly just focus upon God and to ask God what it is he is calling you to do and who he has called you to be. And as I said, some of you already know what that is. And you have to patiently wait as Simeon did. And some of you know that you're coming up against a very difficult decision and you have to wonder, if I, am I going to be faithful to this task or not, as Mary was faithful. Look at the testimony of Scripture. Look into the life of women and men in the Scripture that said, yes, Lord, your will be done and it will encourage you in your journey. So that you will know with certainty is why Luke wrote. And so that we will know with certainty is why we will journey through his words together through this season. 
Father God, it is a joy to be in this place. Father, thank you for speaking to Luke, and Luke, thank you for listening. God, I pray that through the power of your word that we would be faithful. God, I pray that you would truly help us to be those men and women and young people that wait patiently and who act faithfully. God, move in us this morning in a way that alters us so that we may change the world around us. We love you, Lord. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray.